If you are only using natural light in your work, then you know that the struggle is real. If the weather isn't great, if you walk into somebody's house and they don't have many windows, if the time of day is wrong and you're trying to shoot outside and it is, you know, bright and sunny or God forbid pouring rain, you know that you are having to reschedule things, shuffle things around, push your ISO to places that get really uncomfortable, not photograph in rooms where you would like to photograph or be forced to photograph in places that you're like, this, you know, this space is not adding anything to this photo. Those are your limitations. And, you know, creative constraints can be good, but it can also be really helpful to have the tools in your tool belt that allow you to work regardless of the circumstances when it comes to time of day, natural light, you know, colors on the walls, all those different things. So today I am chatting with Kim Hildebrand, who is a family photographer in the Seattle area and who has been teaching flash photography for on-location photo shoots for several years now. She's about to launch a course at the end of January. If you're listening to this when it drops, then this will be relevant to you. If not, you can still check out her stuff and see what she's got coming up. But I wanted to bring her on at this time of year, not only because January for many of us is a challenging time to schedule photo sessions if we are limited to either outdoor sessions or even indoor sessions, but you know, the light is what it is when we're inside. So this is typically also the slower time of year, which is a great time for you to take on a new learning project. So Kim is sharing today what some of the challenges are, what some of the myths are about photographing with flash in a in an in-home kind of a scenario. And I think you're gonna love this conversation. Welcome to This Can't Be That Hard. My name is Anami Tonkin, and I help photographers run profitable, sustainable businesses that they love. Each week on the podcast, I cover simple, actionable strategies and systems that photographers at every level of experience can use to earn more money in a more sustainable way. Running a photography business doesn't have to be that hard. You can do it, and I can show you how. Kim Hildebrand, welcome to This Can't Be That Hard. I am so excited to have you on the show today. How are you? I'm doing well, Anime. How are you? Thanks for having me. I am good. I am uh, just sort of cruising into the end of the year. It's my favorite time of year. I feel like it's always so, like the calm after the storm feels, uh, feels nice. So I'm excited to be chatting today. And I'm really excited to have you on specifically on this topic because I feel like The beginning of the year is often a time when people are sort of making space for projects that they have been kind of meaning to get to. And I feel like figuring flash out is one of those things where when you're in the midst of, you know, shooting and all this other stuff and you you really need to ensure that you know what you're doing when you walk in with a client. It's one thing like you you can maybe try some stuff once or twice, but you don't want to you don't want to bank on something. So the off season is such a great time to just like take your time, practice at home, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that going into this next year, you've got another sort of tool in your tool belt. Why don't we start with just a little bit of your backstory, introduce, you know, who you are. Obviously, I always like to start there, but give us a little bit of your backstory with Flash and and how that you started using that in your portrait work. Yeah, sure. Um, Man, So I have been a newborn family photographer since my youngest, I have two kids. My youngest was born. So like 16 years. Yeah. He just turned 16. So that long. crazy. Um, and my journey, just like most people's journey is kind of taken a circuitous route. I started just shooting mostly outside, you know, cause that's the easiest and the golden hour thing, you know, you just kind of go along trying to figure out what your thing is and what you absolutely love. I had a studio for a while, so I learned how to use flash and strobes like probably 13 years ago. It was quite Mm -hmm. a long time ago and in the studio it was primarily strobes. But after renting a studio for about three years, I just realized that it was almost for me like too much of a blank slate. I Mm -hmm. really, really loved the lifestyle component and almost kind of like a documentary feel of shooting inside people's homes much more just because I felt like their art 
work and the house that they live in and their belongings is all part of their family story. So I really, really just fell in love with that. Along kind of the same time, I reverted back to shooting film. So Mm -hmm. I've been shooting film exclusively with my families for about 10 years. I just love the grain. I love the softness and organic is overused, but the organic feel of it and the skin tones and everything like that. But I had a problem living in Seattle. It's just very, very dark, especially in winter. And so figuring all of that out, trying to make film work in people's homes, North Seattle especially has a lot of older homes. They're very dark, small rooms, right. and they can be very cramped and, you know, not the best window light, especially if you have like winter blue light kind of coming in the window. So for about six months, I was bringing my strobe and my light stand and my umbrellas and like all this gear to homes. And I was just thinking, man, there has to be an easier way. Yeah. And it was actually during a model session, I had this huge aha moment. I walked past this old vintage guest bathroom, guest bathroom in their home that had this cool like mustard and burnt orange and olive like floral wallpaper in there. And I said, oh my gosh, I love this. I want to do something with this. I have to try to like photograph the kids in there. So I was looking around, it was way too small for a strobe. And I thought, well, why can't I just use flash in here and just like bounce it somehow, like Mm -hmm. bounce it off the mirror. So I did that and I metered and I was like, okay, well, we'll just see. There's, you know, no skin in the game really because it's a model session. I'm just gonna kind of see if it works. And I got the film back and I was blown away. Like it looked absolutely just beautiful and naturally lit. Like you would never ever tell that I had used flash in there. So from that point on, even during that session, we probably went and photographed the kids and the whole family in like four or five different rooms. Like I just picked up my flash and I moved it and realized that it's basically a small strobe. Mm-hmm. If you use it correctly, it's exactly the same thing. And that all, you know, you can create any kind of look that you want with flash and light is light. And so that was just my big aha moment. And I've been shooting with flash in homes forever. And I, I mean, I was scared of it too. I think the big barrier to entry for people trying flash in home, whether or not you're a digital shooter or a film shooter is that you feel like it's, it is adding a whole nother level of complication to your shoots for Mm -hmm. sure. But once you understand the concept, it's quite easy. Like you just can kind of set it and forget it really. Right. So I'm very passionate about it. I love it. I love that. And I mean, it really does. When you think about the disruption to your ability to work that can come into play with the weather, the, you know, all of these different factors, you show up at somebody's house, they have a beautiful room, but it has no, you know, natural light or very little natural light or maybe too much direct sun, you know, like the sun's streaming in and it's, you know, that's cool for a couple of shots, but you'd really like to feature this room and sort of not do a high contrast thing and you want to fill it with some light. Like you have, you end up with so much more control and the ability to say, okay, great. The weather's not what we were hoping for. No problem. We're just going to, you know, stay inside for most of the session or all of the session as the case may be. Yes, definitely. It it gives you full control regardless of the size of the room, the color of the room, right? You know, you can control your color cast. It gives you so much control and you never have to like shoot at one thirtieth of a second or crank your ISO up right. to whatever God knows what these days you can we do worry about <laughs> noise and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that is fine, but it definitely changes not only the grain in the photo, but you, you know, you end up with like weird saturated colors and all this other mm-hmm. stuff when you're pushing your ISO to its limits. Let's exactly. break this down just a little bit for the people who are listening, who are like, I have never put a flash on my camera or used a flash off my camera. What is the difference between a flash and a strobe? Like give us some of the basics and, and when you're sort of in those situations, what you're thinking about when you're deciding between using just natural light versus flash versus stroke. I always say that flash can be used for so many things. The main reason I love to use it is just to add overall light. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to push your film. You don't have to crank up your ISO, but you can use it to add fill light and bounce light. And you can actually even use it to create more contrast in your images and eliminate color casts. Like, I don't know how many times I've walked into a home 
and they have all the recessed can lights on, you know, and the lamps and there's all this tungsten light. And I do love a little bit of like cozy tungsten light as long as it's not like falling on their skin. Right. Sure. But you can even use flash to eliminate color casts and just create really clean images. And I will back up a little bit. So I had talked about strobe and flash and there are different types of light sources you can use. So 101 is like flash is the little bendable one that a lot of people just like stick on their camera that has a little hot shoe mm -hmm. and you can turn the head. So it's a lighter, it's smaller, it's more inexpensive typically. It's very, very portable. It does have less power. And one drawback to a flash unit over a strobe is that it doesn't have a modeling light. And a modeling light is just a light that is fully on the whole time. And it kind of will show you like where the light is going to fall on your subject. So that's a learning curve. And then a strobe, like I had said earlier, they're, they're also called mono lights. They are like a bigger unit that you do have to set up on a light stand, typically with a modifier, although you can bounce them. They're more expensive. They do have a higher power output. So that's a plus, and they usually typically have modeling lights. But because you do have to use them on a stand with a modifier, I just find them a little more cumbersome if I'm shooting on location all the time. So yeah. that's why flash has been a lifesaver for me. Yeah. Just really quickly, a third type of light that I get asked a lot about is just a continuous light source, you know, mm -hmm. like an ice light or like a video light where you don't have that burst of flash. They are getting better and they are getting more powerful, but still they aren't ideal for still film photography with power output to give you enough light to like be able to freeze movement and things yeah. like that. So I still err towards the ones that have the burst of light. And although that requires some learning curve and all that sort of thing, once you figure it out, and it really is one of those things I remember in my own journey as a photographer, I, ha I absolutely had that like, how am I going to figure this out? How can I add one more thing to, you know, what I'm already trying to manage? It's just going to be too much. And then this was back when I was shooting weddings. And I was like, well, I have to learn. I have to know how to do this. And yeah, it was like there was that aha moment the same way as when I sort of cracked the the exposure triangle code. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, now it's totally <laughs> intuitive. But it really is one of those things that until you get it, you just have to trust that you will get there. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It is doable and it is such a handy thing to have uh, in your arsenal. And I feel like when it comes to flash versus strobe, I mean, strobes are great. They are very powerful. But when we're talking about doing, especially like in-home family type stuff, most people don't live in, you know, the Versailles or whatever, like <laughs> their, <Right. laughs> their houses are reasonably sized. And I feel like the flash power most of the flash units have these days is more than enough to give you really nice bounce light or whatever in a in a house. So that's, that's yeah. great. I love that you're doing this with film because that is an added layer. I don't shoot film for, <laughs> for clients. And I feel like yeah. the confidence required to shoot when you can't see a preview to like dial in your flash <laughs> settings is an extra leap of faith. So that is very much a feather in your cap. You clearly know uh, what you're doing. Thank you. I do have a little trick for that. Yeah. Oh, so okay. I do bring a digital camera along with me, which I think is invaluable. First of all, quick story. Last fall, my I use a contact 645 film camera and it's just stopped working. Sure. Right? Yeah. They are lovely cameras, but they are a little bit of a diva quirky. Um, just, yes. you, know, you have to like clean the connection points and make sure it's all going to work. But I had my digital camera with me. So I was able to still do the shoot. But the main reason I bring a digital camera is since a flash, you cannot see the pattern of light before you're shooting. And I don't want to waste a whole roll of film is I take a digital test shot just to check out the pattern of the light. Once I know that's good, my light meter never lies to me. So I know that I'll have enough light to expose the scene then I switched to my film camera. So amazing little, little trick. Yeah. And when you sort of arrive in a house and you say, okay, this, you know, the light is such that we're going to be using flash. How mm -hmm. many times within, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to go into the nursery and we're going to set up in there and we're going to play for a little bit. And then later we're going to move into the living room and we're going to play in there for a little bit. 
Do, are you moving your flash a lot during that sort of scene or do you kind of put it in one place, leave it, and then the only time you move it is when you change locations in the house? I set it and forget it. Yeah. I set it and forget it. Just like those indoor rotisserie grills. So you just like set it all up. And I actually have a really cool series on my website that illustrates this very thing because I find it fascinating. It's called One Light Many Looks. So it's just my website name, kimhildebrand.com, One Light Many Looks. And it shows you pullbacks of where I actually have the flash in the room. And then in a grid, it shows you all the resulting images I get because I can move around, which is so cool, right? right? Like the flash and the subjects are all in the same spot. Now, if I move them, then yes, I do have to like remeter and all that kind of stuff. But if they're generally in the same area, I can actually move around and just like a lifestyle shoot in natural light, sure. get a ton of different angles, a ton of different shots, close-ups, pullbacks, all that kind of thing with leaving the flash and set it and forget it. Just leave it right there. Amazing. But then, yeah. So then obviously when I switch rooms, I would have to figure out where the flash goes, remeter, do my test shot with my digital camera again, and then start shooting. Yeah. And are you yeah. typically using a light stand with your flash head or do you have some sort of little clamp kind of a thing or how do you, how do you manage that? In my course, I go through this whole like flash placement guide Yeah, and I have like four main questions I ask myself. So one of those is, you know, are there, is there color cast on the walls? Are the ceilings really, really high? There are some instances where I do need to put the flash on a stand, mm -hmm. but for the most part, I try to just use the little flash foot. Nice. And I don't know if you know, you know, that's yeah. like the little, that little plastic thing that no one knows what to do with. Well, I know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I use that flash foot all the time. And I usually just like set it on furniture or in appropriate places where I know it's going to bounce the right way. Nice. And it works like a charm. That thing that hopefully you didn't throw away when you bought your flash unit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where did I put that thing? <laughs> so I feel like as people are wrapping their minds around, like this would really be a useful thing for me to add to my skill set, they have some like hesitations about flash. And I know that for me, mm -hmm. one of the one of the big ones was not just like how am I going to figure this out, but like how much is this going to cost me in terms of you know because <clears throat> there when you go just like dive into B&H and start looking around, right. there's such a wide range. There's, it's like, okay, I'm going to buy a flash, but do I need multiple flashes? And do I need all these different stands and modifiers and all that sort of thing? What can someone expect when it comes to getting started? My equipment that I use consistently was under $300. It's wow. nice. not that expensive at all. Contrary to popular belief, you don't need a really expensive flash unit you need one that will, that you can turn into slave mode. Mm -hmm. You need one that will go into manual mode instead of through the lens, TTL. Mm -hmm. And my flash was $80. Nice. And there are flash units out there that are $80. And in my course, I go more in depth with this. But since I shoot with a variety of brands of cameras, I shoot with a non-branded flash. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like a universal flash that will talk with any of the cameras and the triggers that I use. Nice. So that's one key thing to look for. So between the flash and then I use three triggers because I shoot with a couple different cameras. Mm -hmm. I have three wireless triggers that I use and you can get a two pack of those for like 180. So it put me right at about 300. And that's nice. if you already have like your digital camera and sure. you already have if you're a film sure, you, you should have your meter, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just the added equipment. It's, it does not really cost that much to get started. Nice. Yeah. In the funny. in the photography world, I feel like $300 is just this like pocket change that falls out right. when you're spending money <laughs> on photography. <laughs> okay. And then the, the next question, and I know you have sort of mentioned this, but I do think that when someone starts playing with Flash for the first time, they often get very scared and start, you know, and mm -hmm. say, never mind, I don't want to do this because I hate the way my photos look. They look, it's very yeah. obvious that I'm using a flash. Like, it does not look like my more natural light lifestyle photos. And you see people's photos out there that say this is shot with flash and it doesn't, it doesn't look like that. We know it can be done, but it is, that mm -hmm. is sort of a really tricky piece of the learning curve. Do you feel like that's an 
achievable thing for anybody, regardless of your equipment and all that sort of thing? Anyone can do it. Yeah, it's it goes back to what you talked about earlier, like you had your aha moment learning the um, exposure triangle. There's a similar triangle that's a flash exposure triangle. And then the third component is marrying those two together. So like the natural light triangle and the flash exposure triangle, which I go into in depth in my course. But you can make an image with flash added look any way you want. So you can make it look bright and airy. You can make it look very dramatic and flashy if you want. It's all just putting those components together and kind of plugging them in. So my course has, a, I have a whole worksheet called the plug and play process that really, really simplifies it. So it's not overwhelming and you will have your aha moment <laughs> if you read that. But yeah, you can make flash look any way you want. So nice. if people are getting images that look really flashy, they're just not plugging in the correct numbers to get the look that they want. Excellent. So tell us a little bit more about this course. Are, who is it for and how long can someone expect if they kind of dive in and really go through the whole thing until they feel like they are ready to go use flash on a shoot? The course is called Lighting for Lifestyle. Illuminate your in-home photos with flash. I actually released it in 2018 and you know, then we moved and then everything life happened, right? And then we built a house. So it's been crazy. So anyway, I've been diving right back into it and revamping it. And I've added a ton more tools and worksheets and supporting materials. Nice. Um, but it is going to be launching in late January and it's a six week course. And it is for film shooters that are looking to add flash to their in-home work. It's for digital shooters as well. I have a lot of digital shooting videos and um, supplemental materials. I would suggest that photographers know how to confidently use whatever camera they're shooting and they know how to confidently work with film outside for sure. Mm -hmm. They know how to use their light meter. But it could be um, for any photographer that's just looking to add another tool to their toolkit who is looking for a smaller, more portable option versus using a strobe. Although I do have some information in there about strobe, but it's mostly about my love of flash. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so six weeks. So it would start end of January, and then we will be graduating this new class in the beginning of March. So exciting. Excellent. Well, this episode is going to drop. If you're listening to it right around the time it drops, you are in luck and in time to go snag a spot in that course. Is there a wait list? Is there some sort of material they can dive into on the sooner side so that they can get on your list? How does how does that work? How do people reach out to you? They can go to kimhildebrand.com slash flash. And in there, I have this awesome freebie that they can sign up to get. It shows them five before and after scenarios where I added flash and I kind of digest my problem solving and what you know, what was the problem before and then what the resulting image was. And then there's this really cool flash flow chart at the end to help people get started and kind of refamiliarize themselves with flash. Nice. So it's kimhildebrand.com flash. I think it's pretty cool. I hope they do too. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, once they get on my list, they will be getting updates about um, the course launch and a bunch of other really cool supplemental freebies to help them determine if it's right for them. I love it. Oh, Kim, this has been great. I heartily recommend if you are out there trying to make your way with natural light all the time, this, you know, this year is your year to familiarize yourself with. Honestly, it like opens up an, a whole new, you know, room in the house of your photography business. So I think it's definitely worth doing. And Kim is such a great instructor. So Kim, thank you so much. I hope you have a great day and a great start to your new year. And I'm sure that I will be seeing you back around here sometime soon. Thank you so much, Anna May. Thanks for having me. Happy holidays to you. To you too. Well, that's it for this week's episode of This Can't Be That Hard. I'll be back same time, same place next week. In the meantime, you can find more information about this episode, along with all the relevant links, notes, and downloads at thiscan'tbethathard.com slash learn. If you like the podcast, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Even better, share the love by leaving a review in iTunes. And as always, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic week.